and welcome to Five in Five. Today I'm talking about the 2005 documentary Amy, directed by Azif Kapadia. And one thing to note before I even get into any frames from the film is this poster for the film. And at the top it tells you it's from the award-winning team behind Senna. Now Senna obviously is another documentary made by Asif Kapadia. And he describes his three documentaries, Senna, Amy and Maradona, um, as a trilogy about hugely talented people that died in tragic circumstances. People that grew up in the media spotlight but probably were slight outsiders who found it difficult to live in the world that they inhabited. All three of these documentaries were constructed in the same way. They all use archive footage to tell almost the entire story. I think in Amy there's probably a couple of drone shots that are particularly filmed um, for the production. But to rely so heavily on archive footage is quite unusual for documentaries and that's what makes these documentaries particularly worthy of study. All of this archive footage is stitched together using voiceovers from Amy's friends and family. Apparently these were recorded like radio interviews rather than TV interviews to avoid the camera affecting the sorts of things that the interviewee said. So what we end up with is a very personal account of Amy and Amy's life and the things that she experienced. Another unusual thing is that we hear a lot of Amy's voice and so Amy in this documentary is like a narrator of her own life and I think that's partly why this documentary is really very very sad and creates a real emotional response in the audience. Now even though I've said that this contains personal stories, um, interviews with friends and families and creates an emotional response, I've also used the word construction and that's because we need to remember that this is a construction of Amy's life. All documentaries need to be questioned in terms of their truth and what they're trying to persuade the audience to think. What we don't hear in this documentary is Azif Kapadia's actual voice. So we don't necessarily get his opinion directly and honestly, which we might get with other documentary makers. However, undoubtedly, there is a reason for him making this documentary and a message that he wants to put across. Having said all of that, Kapadia is known for not scripting his documentaries and for not kind of creating treatments or storyboards or anything like that. He kind of lets the story unfold. He shows the documentary to an audience and then re-edits from there. So he creates in a very natural way, which we might argue creates a less biased and more truthful documentary, but that's something that you might want to debate. I think the fact that Kapadia started making the documentary just a year after Amy died perhaps adds to its honesty. We do get lots of raw emotions from Amy's friends and family and that again makes it feel more immersive. If we're more cynical, another reason for making the documentary so quickly could have been to do with profit. So Amy took $24 million at the box office worldwide. So this was undoubtedly a hugely profitable venture. And of course, one of the themes in the documentary is people profiting from Amy's success. So even after her death, people are still making money from her. So let's get on to analysing some frames. And the first frame I've chosen is from the very beginning of the documentary. And I'm a big believer if you're analysing films and writing essays, good examples can be found at the beginning, middle and end. So I've started with the beginning and this shot, this three shot of Amy, Julia and another friend um, really sets the scene for this documentary. We're told that this is Lauren's 14th birthday, so we get a sense of how young they are. And what they're doing is, is mucking around. They're mucking around on the stairs, offering Lauren a lick of their lollipops, um, which is pretty gross. They look all sort of covered in saliva. We can see from the grainy handheld footage that this is genuine archive material. This would have been recorded on a camcorder. And that Kapadia says is that camcorder footage kind of tends to last longer than digital footage today. Because if you think about it, when we're filming on our phones, we often delete things straight away. If we, we get a bit of video we don't like or a photo we don't like, we just delete it and do it again. So often, you know, in the past when people were, were recording on camcorders, they kept their tapes and, and this is what we have. So this moment from Lauren's birthday and um, we've got this fun and mucking around, just being silly on the stairs. We can see Amy's kind of central in the frame. She's quite clearly a key part of the friendship group. And then a few frames later, we see her actually singing happy birthday to Lauren and we are sort of blown away by her voice 
the quality of her voice, the way that she makes the song Happy Birthday completely her own. So this is a really effective opening, creating this image of Amy as being young and naive and kind of childlike, but also an incredible talent right from the very start. The on-screen graphics here are used to establish the date and the place. The date's really important in this documentary because if we're coming to it and we know what's happened to Amy, this helps us kind of plot whereabouts she is in her life and what's going on. Helps us keep track of the footage that we're seeing as well and helps create this linear narrative that Kapadia has favoured. The place I think is also really important because it shows where Amy started off, it shows her roots, but also I think London is very important to Amy. We get this sense in the documentary at one point she says that she's won an award and it's for London. She's very much a London girl. What's ironic there is that obviously she loves London and she loves living in London and we see the different flats that she lives in but equally she is hounded in London. Later on we see all this paparazzi press hanging around outside her door and the British press perhaps have got a reputation as being particularly harsh towards the people that they're chasing so there's that double-edged sword of London being her home where she loves but also becoming quite a dangerous uh, and frightening environment for her. The other reason I've chosen this image is because I think it really establishes the friendship group of Amy, Lauren and Juliet. We hear a lot of Juliet's voice throughout the documentary. She gets particularly upset towards the end of the documentary. In fact, we come back to photos of Juliet, Amy and Lauren towards the end of the documentary. And this is just before we start to see Amy's funeral. We've heard that Amy has contacted Juliet. She's apologised to Juliet. And Juliet felt at that time very positive about the Amy that she was seeing. So we see these images here. We can see just this one of the three of them kind of obviously prepared for a nativity play. There's another photo of them on holiday together. So there's almost a sense of circularity in the narrative, beginning with the friendship group, ending with the friendship group, and perhaps suggesting that these friendships were the most important for Amy's life, the most solid and the most consistent friendships that she had. So I think this footage and these photographs that bookend the documentary really show how Kapadia has chosen his material very carefully in order to create this really emotional effect. And this reinforces the idea that no documentary can ever be truly just observational because the editing process creates meaning and creates messages that pure observation wouldn't necessarily include. So the second frame I've chosen is this lap dissolve of Amy playing the guitar and her lyrics over the top. These types of images are quite common throughout the documentary. We see her handwritten lyrics adding that authenticity, which gives a feel of the process that she goes through while she's writing, but also feels, again, very personal, almost like we're reading her diary. The lyrics themselves almost narrate what's going on in her life, so... When she's singing, say, Back to Black, we'll see the lyrics and then we might see images of Blake um, while that song is going on. So they've been, again, very carefully chosen to tell the story and to really illustrate what's going on. The reason why I chose this one in particular is that we can see this extreme close-up of Amy playing the guitar. And again, that idea of her being a musical sort of genius. She's got this virtuosity. She is brilliant at what she does. And this is a real representation that is built up over time. So that when we find out that she's died, it really is a tragedy. Another representation that's being created is through the lyrics themselves. We can tell that Amy was a troubled soul because of some of the darkness in the lyrics. Here she talks about deep regret and responsibility. And again, considering how young she was at the time of writing, it suggests she's a sort of old soul that has experienced difficult things. And of course, one of the reasons she was praised as an artist was because of her lyrics and the kind of depth and emotion that they portrayed. And that idea of her having an older sounding voice than would be expected in one so young. One final thing to mention here about the lyrics and the music used in the documentary is that this is a typical convention of this type of documentary. Obviously a music documentary, we would expect to hear music in there. But it does reflect to some extent on the budget for this documentary to be able to use as much of Amy's music as there is. There must have been a fairly healthy budget 
to get the rights to these things. So for my third frame, which is actually two frames from slightly different moments in the film, I've chosen them because they show moments of success in Amy's career and moments where she can't believe the success that she's having. In the second frame, we can see her singing and recording with Tony Bennett. In the foreground are the sort of microphones and the music paraphernalia. Just again, reinforcing that representation of her being such a focused and fantastic singer. But she can't quite believe that she is singing with Tony Bennett. And in that scene, we sort of see her frustration in terms of singing with him and just wanting to do her absolute best. In the frame above, this is when she's presented with a Grammy and the Grammy is presented by Tony Bennett. And again, her facial expression suggests her disbelief and again, just being starstruck by who it's being presented by. Amy's in the foreground while well, everyone else is in the background. There's a shallow focus. The key thing to notice here is the difference between the quality of the footage. So this is still archive footage, but it's not home produced archive footage. This is professionally shot by television crews creating maybe other documentaries or filming for other purposes. And this is what makes this documentary so successful is this combination of home video with professional video with sadly paparazzi images as well. The paparazzi images get more and more intense as well and although I haven't chosen a frame from one of those paparazzi moments they do feel incredibly overwhelming as we watch them. They're hard to watch because of the flashing lights and that provides a really stark contrast to what we're seeing here. The lighting in both of these images has been really well considered to give Amy that sort of glamorous look, that kind of healthy look that we want to see. But the lighting in those paparazzi shots, as I say, is completely overwhelming. It feels almost like we're being assaulted with these camera flashes that really are difficult to look at and produce a sort of visceral response in the audience. But despite the fact that it makes us feel really uncomfortable, those paparazzi shots need to be there in order to create a really well-rounded documentary. It gives us a flavour of the experience that Amy went through. We don't even have to imagine it. We're kind of seeing it and experiencing it firsthand. So I am obsessed with mirrors in films. And I think this mirror in this film is a really, really poignant moment. The fact that it's broken, shattered all over the floor is really reflective of Amy's state of mind at this point. It's for a photo shoot, so we're not shown the breaking of the glass or given any kind of impression that Amy's done it, but we do see her sort of picking up the glass and holding it against her stomach, and I think it just shows her vulnerability and um, fragility. I always talk about mirrors and identity and how mirrors often present a different identity to us or an unstable identity to us. And I'm not suggesting that that's the case here, but clearly there's a lot going on behind the scenes at this point in Amy's life that is making her feel very fragile. The broken mirror also perhaps reflects the broken relationship between her and Blake, although the following shots do show us how much she is in love with him. Um, but as an audience, knowing where that leads, we can see that that innocent love that she feels for him actually is disastrous. Perhaps also the mirror represents that need to hurt herself and sort of self-harm. And again, this is flagging up all sorts of issues that Amy experienced. So I think this image is particularly poignant. And although we do see other stills of Amy taking drugs and Amy looking bruised and bloody when she's leaving nightclubs we see you know very clear images of how she's hurting herself actually this one i think is really powerful she's at the height of her career but here she is all alone taking up a tiny amount of the frame upside down in this reflection it seems particularly sad so it does seem wrong to finish on a frame that features amy's dad mitch but I haven't mentioned him anywhere else in this video, so I feel he's got to be in there somewhere. And with this two shot of Mitch and Amy, we can see that the camera is intruding on a private moment between the two of them. And this isn't a camera crew that Amy has invited to be with her on her holiday in St Musia. This is a camera crew that is following Mitch around. If we consider the mise-en-scene here, we can see that Amy is very relaxed. Her hair isn't in her normal beehive style. She's obviously just let it become natural. Um, she's wearing very little clothes. We're told that St Lucia is somewhere that she feels comfortable, that she's relaxed, she feels safe in. So the fact that Mitch brings a camera crew along with him when he joins her is even more shocking and we suspect his motives. 
Amy's dad Mitch did criticise the film saying that there was no balance in the film and that he wasn't represented in a particularly good way but Asif Kapadia did defend the documentary um, saying even now there are people who kind of think it's about them and it's not about them so there's a suggestion there that maybe Mitch is trying to steal the limelight and, and profit even more even though his daughter is dead it's important to remember when we're thinking about representation it's not just about who's on screen it's who's off screen as well and obviously Mitch spends a lot of time not in the documentary not featuring at all and I do wonder if there is a relationship between him and Amy which hasn't been represented on screen certainly Amy's got the uh, tattoo that says daddy so there must have been some sort of relationship which again I think makes this scene here quite hard to watch because it's clear that Amy does feel that she's being taken advantage of by having this camera crew here. The fact that he's seen with his own documentary crew and his film kind of talking to Amy and talking with her fans and potentially kind of telling off her off a bit does reinforce this idea that maybe her father kind of sees her as a little bit of a cash cow, um, a commodity to make lots of money from. Overall, this documentary does really engage the audience and like all documentaries we experience a range of different responses particularly I think we have a psychological response we really wonder why Amy behaves the way she does and we wonder why people around her treat her the way she does for example going back to the frame with the mirror why did anyone ever think that was a good idea to present her with a broken mirror and get her to pose with it we question why some of those celebrities and comedians that we see on screen needed to say anything about her. So we're really thinking about how the documentary is made, so a cognitive response. We're thinking about psychologically what's going on in people's minds. We're being really self-reflexive as well and we're thinking about what we would do in those situations. We're having a real emotional response as well though and a sensory response too because of the physical reaction that we have to some of the images that we're seeing so it really is a documentary that engages people and offers the opportunity to be a really active audience really experiencing lots of different responses thanks for watching i hope that's useful like and subscribe if you can i'll be doing another video on amy comparing it to nick broomfield's documentary kurt and courtney so stay tuned for that